We have just come out of a period of great expectation in Christian circles, for some were suggesting the possibility that Christ would come for his bride on September 11th of this year, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me the reason why we should study prophecy in the scriptures. We call it the elusive future. Mm. And Jr., we've witnessed over the years several, uh, shall we say, periods of excitement in Christian circles, uh, during which time people have really uh, had their hopes elevated as to the soon approach uh, of, uh, of the Lord for his church. And excitement rose in a wave, and then when the day came and went, there was a, uh, a more or less a disappointment, sometimes greater, sometimes lesser, and causing a, a many people to question the study of prophecy itself. But we believe that properly, uh, properly approached, the study of Bible prophecy is a blessing. It is urged, in fact, by the Lord himself. He urged it upon his own people in his own day. He castigated the Pharisees for not knowing the times and seasons. And so we study prophecy. Today we're going to look at the big picture of prophecy as it appears throughout Scripture. Now, Gary, I must say that those a century ago who set dates were loudly criticized when their date came and went. Yes. And even in the recent past, those who have set dates have been critically looked upon by other uh, Christians, but I do not hear those voices of dissent this month. Um, I don't know exactly why. Uh, perhaps it's because uh, they're saying, oh, here we go again, mm -hmm. or maybe they just don't see the importance of it, but what we would like for you to see today is the study of prophecy is very much a viable method of studying the scriptures. We do not want to, shall we say, proverbially throw out the baby with the bathwater. We need to understand that there is a futurist aspect to the Bible. And that's what we want to approach today. J.R., let's just uh, take the Bible itself and, uh, <clears throat> and just look at the book. The book begins with creation. It ends with the new heavens and the new earth. It has a, a very obvious chronology. It begins... Uh, with the, re the, the need for a redemptive process, and it ends with redemption. So th there's a thread throughout history. We find ourselves on a timeline. We're moving along this timeline. And because we are trapped, as it were, at each moment in time, uh, we, we can't reach out and see the future. To us, it is all a vast unknown, and yet Scripture urges us to attempt to understand the times and the seasons. And it can be a very exciting study. Yes, it was the Apostle Paul who said, we see through a glass darkly. And it was in Psalm 119, I think, where the scripture says, where the psalmist writes, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathways. So we are groping in the dark, folks. Every second of time that is yet to come is future. And as immediately, as soon as it arrives, it becomes past. Mm -hmm. So uh, we would almost have to say uh, there is no present. <laughs> yeah. It is so quickly gone and, and uh, into the past. And so as we look at the scriptures, understand that the Old Testament is, um, uh, is, is simple, it's history, it's practical application. You get into the New Testament, you look at the futurist part of the scripture, mm -hmm. the blessed hope, why Jesus came and died to save mankind. And we will live forever in a heaven. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And this is futurist. And so when we look at the Bible overall, we can see the futurist aspects mm -hmm. in the last portions of the Bible. And people who don't believe in prophecy uh, are like, we're going to throw out the last chapters of every yes. book, you know. Well, and that brings an important point. Uh, the fact that the books themselves are arranged in the same way as the whole structure. Uh -huh. The whole structure beginning with the far, far distant past and ending with the far, far distant future. In fact, each of the books of the Bible is structured that very same way. Right. Not only is the New Testament the futurist part of the Bible, but of the New Testament, the last chapter, the last books of it um, leading up to the book of Revelation is the futurist part. Mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the simple, the you know, the, 
it, it, it goes on the various levels of biblical interpretation. Mm -hmm. When you look at the Old Testament, you see that, that the books of Moses uh, lay the groundwork and the, the Old Testament ends with the prophets. So what we're saying here is every time, everything you look at in the Bible is is designed this way. The structure of the scripture begins with the simple, ends with the complex, ends and, with the futures. And it pulls you into the future, shall we say. It, uh, I think the student of Bible prophecy is, is nothing more or less than someone who's interested in looking deeply into scripture. And when you do, you will be pulled into the future as though you had stepped into some stream and were caught up in the current. Right. And that is what Bible study is all about. You know, it's interesting, Gary, that a, that a famous politician recently said that, that uh, Christianity is just a, um, a ruse. It's for people who are weak, the weak-minded the, the weak people, you know. And the truth of the matter is um, Christianity is... Uh, the the faith and belief in the future, yeah. you know, and so it's all futurist. And it uh, it involves intellect, and it involves a great deal of courage, a willingness to be led of the Lord. By the way, that is not for the weak. Yes, <laughs> that is that's for the for the faithful and and those who will believe. But those who don't understand yeah. look upon it perhaps as weakness. Yeah. Now let's uh, move along into our study, and I'm going to hand it off to J.R. here in just a second, but we're going to turn to the book of Genesis, where everything began, and see how uh, not only does it talk about creation, it talks about the far distant future as well. You know, actually all five books of Moses have this same design. Genesis begins with the uh, simple of the history yeah. of the creation and uh, early man, and it ends with Deuteronomy, which is futurist. Mm -hmm. And so when we get to Genesis itself, Genesis has 50 chapters, but when you get over to chapters 41 through 50, you see the sowed level, the secret level, the, pro, the futurist level of the book of Genesis. So when you're studying the book of Genesis, hey, don't leave out chapters 41 through 50. You've got to understand that prophecy is a viable study of Scripture. And that's where we get to Joseph, rejected by his brothers, becomes the... Uh, governor of the land and uh, so here's the rejected messiah finally being recognized by his brethren joseph uh, very commonly perceived as a type of christ joseph uh, saves his brothers and he does it through a prophetic dream in which uh, he was shown that there would be seven good years uh, of crops uh, in egypt followed by seven bad years and he uh, instigates a program to save grain, and as a result, people survive the famine. And Joseph is exalted over all in Egypt. And I'm going to read... Takes a Gentile bride. Oh, that's yeah. Amazing. Gentile bride. Uh, and that's given in, in Genesis 41, 45. Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnat Paneah, gives him a Gentile name, and gave him uh, to wife Asenath, a Gentile bride, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, and Joseph went uh, out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, J.R., this is prophetic. Yeah. It is deep. It is weighty. It is filled uh, with uh, metaphor, with symbol. For example, Joseph's new name, Zafnat Paneah, means revealer of secrets. The name of his bride, Asenath, means she who is of Neath, who is the goddess. Uh, we know her in our day as the goddess Minerva, the goddess of war. She's also the goddess Columbia. There's a statue of her atop uh, the, the Capitol in Washington, D.C. And here is this Gentile bride of Joseph, comes down through the ages to the present day, and lo and behold, there's a statue of this woman on the top of our own Capitol building. This is a mystery that reaches out into the far distant future, and it's a picture of redemption, because here is a, a righteous man who takes upon himself the trappings of pagan uh, Gentile priesthood takes a Gentile bride and brings righteousness to the Gentiles, and we're just we haven't even scratched and saves the his brothers, the Jewish nation, while he's at it, and saves the Jewish nation. <laughs> and boy, are they ever surprised when he reveals himself to them. This is sowed level. Um, 
we have not discussed the, the four levels of Jewish interpretation, but That's I right. can tell you that uh, in Christianity we look at the scriptures generally as the primary interpretation of scripture, that's past, the practical application of scripture, that's present tense, and then the futurist portion is the prophetic implications of scripture. And you will see that in the designs of the Bible. And so the important thing we want to get across to you is the study of the futurist portions of scripture is just as important as the study of the other two levels of interpretation. We're going to look at Joseph and his death and finally Jacob's death when we return in just a moment. We're looking at the futurist portions of the Bible. Looking at the book of Genesis, first of all, since that's the first book of the Bible, to show you that chapters 41 through 50 are futurist. And, and when we use the term futurist, we're talking about the prophetic implications of Scripture. There are a lot of people today who do not believe the Bible has prophetic portions that it is simply a book of past and prologue and a practical application and most sermons you hear are history mm -hmm. and uh, practical application. That's true. But in our look at the Bible we want you to know that the study of prophecy that is, is a, another level of biblical interpretation and that we need to be concerned with it. We cannot prognosticate by it, mm -hmm. for we do not know the future. We see through a glass darkly. And let me just say quickly, uh, we're going to look at Genesis 49. Before we do, uh, we've mentioned this before, we'll mention it again, that to, to the Jews there are four levels of interpretation. Uh, J.R. just mentioned three levels. Uh, the Jews uh, talk about a Peshat level, which is its basic interpretation, from uh, uh, Remez, which is a hint Drosh, which is threshing, which takes you even deeper, and finally Sod, which is secret, mm -hmm. the fourth level being yeah. so far under the text that it requires spe special revelation. And uh, we believe through the Holy Spirit. Well, let's look at that for just a moment, Gary. The simple level is for, uh, you know, the elementary. Mm -hmm. Okay. The hint level is for the choir. You're yes. preaching to the choir. That is... Uh, when I tell you something and you've already read the Bible and you've studied it for years, I don't have to tell you that a certain verse that I quoted is from Matthew 40, uh, chapter 17 and a certain yeah. verse, you know, because you already relate. You remember. I know where that is. That's the hint level. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the philosophical level. It's the intellectual level. It's the college level. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get to the drosh, that's when you take some grain of wheat and, and you uh, put it in your hand and you separate the chaff from the grain and you come out with the grain. That's the threshing. The, yeah. uh, that's the regal level, the, the level of, uh, of the kings. Of the kings, that's okay? right. But when you get to, the, to that sowed level, the secret level, that's beyond the that's God's viewpoint of the scripture. You're, you're really walking in tall cotton then. <laughs> Which brings us, by the way, further along in Genesis, uh, after the incident of Joseph, and I wish we had to longer to talk about it, we get to the incident of Jacob and his sons. Now, this is secrecy personified. We are, we are at the secret level here. And I've got to confess, there's much about this that I don't understand. It's yet future. Yes. The dying Jacob gives prophecies of what will befall each of his sons in the last days. That's sowed secret level. And that's chapter 49 of Genesis. So you see, Genesis starts out with the simple, ends with the complex, starts out with the Peshat level, then goes to the mm -hmm. Remez level and the Drosh level and ends up with the sowed or secret level. That's the prophetic futurist level of scripture. And I have to point out very quickly that the very last verse of Genesis, which is Genesis 50, 26, says, So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. He became one of those mummies that we see on television. Mm -hmm. We see specials on Egypt. And, and he was preserved, and he was taken into the promised land. Now, J.R., if that isn't pulling us into a future, the future secret level, I don't know what is. That's right. Let's look at the book of Exodus now. Exodus begins with the burning bush and the uh, Moses going into Egypt, uh, uh, rescuing the people. It's, it's a simple level. It's a practical level. 
it's a threshing level. But when you get over to uh, chapters 36 through 40, you reach the sowed level of the book of Exodus. That's mm. the construction of the tabernacle, the setting it up, and then the Shekinah glory of God comes down and fills the place. And uh, we read in Exodus 36, 1, Then wrought Bezalel and Oholiab and every wise-hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service and sanctuary according to all the Lord had commanded. That's the secret level, mm -hmm. because we have these two men who are, shall we say, inducted into the great secrets of God and given the secrets of how to build the sacred vessels. Yeah. <laughs> this is terrific. Leviticus. I want you to notice Leviticus starts out with the um, uh, sacrifices. That's the, the simple level. And then it gets into the more complex, the hint levels, uh, what this sacrifice means, what that sacrifice means. It uh, talks about kosher foods mm -hmm. and, the, and the personal cleanliness of it, the practical level. But when you go over to chapters 23 through 27, Gary, you enter that sowed level of prophetic implications of Leviticus. Mm -hmm. Well, Leviticus, J.R., is, uh, is surrounded, it is the trappings, shall we say, uh, that surround the feasts of Israel. It's an amazing uh, story because the feasts provide a framework. Yes. And then the rest of, uh, uh, of the life of Israel is, is festooned upon those feasts or that structure. Yes. Now, I might mention this, that even though we see the sowed level at the end of each book, the last chapters of each book. You can take chapter one of each book and find all four levels of interpretation, the past, the present, and the future, out of every verse in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at it from a structural viewpoint now to show you the importance of the study of prophecy. By the way, J.R., we should point out, when we're talking about the feasts of Israel, Leviticus 23, and then moving on, uh, we are talking about... Uh, deep, weighty, metaphoric studies. Each of the yes. feasts, J.R., is filled with book upon book of, of symbolism. Yeah. And that symbolism is being worked out. And when you, if you've ever done a complete weighty study on the, the feasts of Israel, you know that you're getting into secret, sacred, holy ground. Right. Prophecy. In fact, the first advent of Christ with his death, burial, and resurrection is a fulfillment of Passover, mm -hmm. unleavened bread, feast of first fruits. Yeah, that's right. The, the uh, last uh, feasts of Rosh Hashanah, uh, that is the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, that's all futurist. So yes. uh, Leviticus certainly has its last chapters deal with the future. It is that flowing river we're talking about yes. from creation to the new heavens and the new earth. It all just flows along, and it invites you to step along, step in and flow along with it. Yeah. When you get to the book of Numbers, it starts out with the simple. They take, you know, it's the beginning yes. of the 40 years in the wilderness, and they take the census, and then it, it gets uh, into the practical level and the murmurings of the people. Oh, yes. But when it gets over to chapters 23 through 27, and Balaam, he's a type of the future Antichrist, mm -hmm and uh, Mystery Babylon and the Battle of Armageddon, this is all futurist. Yes, it is. And it begins uh, when King Balak seeks out a prophet for hire to cast a curse upon the nation Israel. And uh, it's a long story, but we have in, in uh, Numbers 22, 20, And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. Mm -hmm. Balaam tried everything he could to curse the Israelites. He was unable to do so. Yeah. And, and as J.R. says, he is a prophecy of the future Antichrist. And a study of Balaam reveals much about the secret level of mm -hmm. evil as it opposes the kingdom of God. When you get to the book of Deuteronomy, it begins, uh, you know, with Moses recounting their past 40 years. It mm -hmm. talks about the practical... Uh, parts of the coming uh, kingdom and how Joshua is going to take them in. But listen, when you get over to chapters 29 through 34, huh, you get to that futurist level again. Oh, it yeah. always ends up at the end of the book, doesn't it? Always at the end of the book. In every case, uh, Deuteronomy 29, these are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab beside the covenant which he made with them at Horeb. 
Oh, another covenant. What's this one all about? Mm -hmm. And we see in the closing chapters of this book the outworkings of that covenant, how the people come back into the land. And 1948. of course, we have 1948. Yes, sir. And that uh, uh, we have in Deuteronomy 30, verse 5. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. Mm -hmm. And that's coming back into the land again. Yeah. And then, of course, we have the Song of Moses in chapter 32, which we will sing in Revelation chapter 15. That's right. In chapter 33, we have the, uh, this, this incredible blessings, the seven blessings of the rising again of the house of Israel. It takes us right to the future, mm -hmm. doesn't it? And so if you're the slightest bit disappointed that the Lord hasn't yet come for the church and, and you maybe thought that he was going to around the time of Rosh Hashanah and now you have a ten temptation to be just a little disappointed, don't be disappointed. Yeah. Keep looking up. And if your pastor doesn't teach on prophecy, not to worry. But you need to study prophecy because it's as much a part of the Bible as the rest of it. You'll find in the closing chapters of every book the futurist section, the secret level of biblical prophecy. Hmm. We're going to look on our next program at the prophets of the Old Testament, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, hmm. and see that the last chapters of those books are likewise prophetic. And then we're going to go into uh, the Gospels. It's going to be an incredible study. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment.